Hello, thank you for joining us this morning for Gardening for Wildlife. This presentation is brought to you by the Bob Jones Nature Center and the City of South Lake and Tarrant Regional Water District. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can go ahead and enter them into the little chat box and we'll get back to you with an answer. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our speaker. Thank you for joining us. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us. I want to thank South Lake for inviting the Texas Master Gardeners to um, come speak on gardening to attract birds, butterflies, and beneficials to your garden. Um, I am a Tarrant County Master Gardener. My name is Wanda Stutzman. I have lived in the Keller South Lake area for 27 years, and we enjoy the Cross Timbers um, uh, ecosystem where we have a lot of wildlife. Um, many of you have more than you choose to have, but a lot of us um, have been at home for the last few months and we have been, uh, enjoyed um, a lot, uh, paid more attention, let me say, uh, of all the wildlife that's coming to our yard. Um, and so today uh, I'd like to just talk about what types of plants you can plant um, to attract the wildlife that you're interested in and we're mostly going to focus on butterflies and birds. Um, and then we'll talk about a few other um, types of wildlife. Today, we are um, partnering with TRWD, Tarrant Regional Water District. And they are, um, have a campaign to improve uh, water conservation education in the communities. We have, um, Tarrant, well, Tarrant Regional Water District uh, manages four big water um, bodies of water uh, across a large area, supporting 2.3 million people in today's population. Um, they have created uh, resources to help people manage their water. Um, so under their umbrella is our water supply to um, our residentials, commercial, our flood control, and um, managing the recreation of uh, around large bodies of water. Uh, they have a website, savetarrantwater.com, and there are a lot of beneficial resources for you as a consumer of the water that they manage. Um, you can go to uh, their website and you can request a free sprinkler check. And I know that um, a lot of people have sprinklers in our area. And if they go unchecked, there could be faulty heads. Uh, you possibly could be watering your yard longer than you need to be watering it um, for the type of grass or turf that you have. And they will uh, send a licensed um, sprinkler repair person to your property and they will do a sprinkler check. So please check that out. Um, they also have advice on their website on how often you should water and uh, the best means of watering. They have a uh, calendar of events, classes uh, for you to check out. And so uh, we're very fortunate that they have taken these measures to um, give us resources to improve our water consumption so that we can have a lot of water available in the next 25 to 50 years as our population grows. So we wanna thank them. So let's talk about inviting, an inviting garden for wildlife um, is not necessarily a wildscape, even though we always like to call um, a garden that attracts wildlife a wildscape. So uh, it doesn't have to be uh, wild. Um, it, the, benef the um, characteristics of a good wildscape or garden for wildlife is it provides a lot of food, water, shelter for the wildlife and can be as simple as bird seed in a feeder or a hummingbird feeder, a dish of water, a bird bath, a sh shrub or a tree for them to nest in. Now I know that living in the Cross Timbers area where we are, we have plenty of um, trees for nesting and uh, shrubbery, and we're very fortunate in that we um, 
have uh, not so, um, we have more shade and sun uh, combinations than most people. So we, we are very fortunate in having a lot of opportunities for wildlife to hide and nest. Um, but most of us as master gardeners, we have very extensive um, gardens and we invite a lot of wild life to our gardens uh, through the types of plants that we plant. And uh, we can, uh, with our um, education, we can teach people what plants to plant to invite the specific species that you're looking for. One of the most important things that you have to remember in um, creating a garden where you want to invite wildlife is that you should not use any chemicals in um, maintenance of your garden. Uh, chemicals are, are uh, very harsh and, um, and we'll go into that in just a minute. So why have a wildscape? Um, well, a lot of us have become bird watchers. I know that I just recently noticed that I have a Cooper's hawk in my front yard. I don't know that he's actually nesting in my yard, but his name is Hank now because he's been around long enough I could name him. And so we're all noticing um, a lot more wildlife because we're looking out our windows um, yeah, a lot more by being home. And so the uh, inviting birds, butterflies, beneficial insects like praying mantis, um, dragonflies, things like that. We may also want to invite small animals. Um, we try to avoid inviting the larger animals, but sometimes they come because of the smaller animals. Um, and that has happened in my yard. So, uh, and then more importantly is the plants, um, making sure that you have a healthy yard for you and them. And how to make a wildscape. Um, uh, first, you wanna decide what you want to attract. If you're looking for uh, butterflies, um, then you would maybe go one, down one path for planting. If you're looking for birds, you may go down another path for planting. Um, how much space do you have? Do you want to do a large area or do you want to do a small area? Do you want to actually do a full-blown prairie type wildscape in the corner of your backyard where you kind of let everything go wild uh, with seasonal nectar plants? Um, so you're going to want to make sure that you hit these four things. Food would be native plants, nectar plants, uh, water, a puddle, a bird bath, a pond. A lot of us have swimming pools. Swimming pools um, are a great source of water for wildlife. Uh, shelter, shrubs, rocks, trees, um, brush. Um, we Most of us try not to keep a pile of brush or playing around, but you never know, you may have a wood pile. Um, safety, a great place to raise their young. Um, and that one is really key because the birds, I've noticed this spring, they worked very, very hard to raise their young. And then my rat snake, um, who I named Harry, uh, took advantage of their young. And um, that was not very nice, but that's our whole ecosystem. And that's what we have to deal with. Preparing your soil for nectar plants. Um, let's talk about nectar plants. Ne um, all birds and butterflies receive all their uh, nutrients through nectar. And if you have nectar plants in your garden, you will definitely attract butterflies. Um, uh, creating a successful garden starts with preparing your soil. And let's talk about soil. I know in our cross timbers area, we have sandy soil. In most cases, unless your home was recently and built out on a, what used to be pasture land, uh, that might not be as sandy as what I'm, I have under my 60 something plus post oaks. Um, your uh, identifying your soil is really important to starting any garden. And we in Texas Master Gardeners offer soil sampling through Texas AgriLife Extension and uh, at Texas A&M, and you can reach out to us through our um, helpline or on our website, and you can uh, request a soil sample kit, and we will send it to you. Um, knowing your soil is really important, knowing the nutrients. The test will come back with suggestions on how to amend your soil, but here 
shortly, we'll just um, quickly, we'll just talk about clay soil. Um, probably would need an expanded shell added for drainage um, and um, compost added as you plant um, to amend the soil and get it um, mixed up really well and break down that clay soil. Sandy soil, like at my house, drains off too quickly for a lot of plants. Um, so we add compost um, and in all my flower beds, I add a lot of amendments uh, like compost. A rocky soil, I'm sorry, you may just need a bulldozer. Um, one of the best solutions for rocky soil are raised flower beds. Um, so look into raised uh, flower beds for rocky soil. Uh, a lot of things will not grow well in rocky soil. They don't drain well in places and they're just very difficult to dig in. Um, always install some type of irrigation. A drip irrigation system is what we're promoting because it manages the water um, uh, distribution better than overhead sprinkler systems. Um, overhead sprinkler systems um, tend to, um, the water tends to blow in the wind. Um, they can, the tops can be mowed off of the sprinkler heads and the water just jets out um, into the sky and you may not even realize it until a week um, into the heat of the summer and your grass in that area is completely parched. And you're wondering, well, why is that? Well, you need to run your sprinkler system during the day as you're watching it um, to see if you have any broken sprinkler heads. But drip irrigation is by far the best system. It goes under the mulch, above the soil, and um, you can um, only water where you need water. So um, that's really nice. What do we mean when we say no chemicals? And I wanna to touch on this because this is so important um, to protecting our wildlife. You hear a lot right now about um, bees and pesticides and um, insecticides. And, um, and we know that those two do not go hand in hand um, and that we need to preserve our bee population. So if you ever want, to, if you are wanting to promote uh, wildlife in your garden, then I encourage you to refrain from using the three main pesticides. One is an insecticide, a fungicide, or a herbicide. Um, the home garden, um, it'll do more damage to your home garden than it would um, to the plants you're actually trying to um, prevent growth on. Uh, the damage from these is pesticides are broad spectrum and they're non-selective. Um, so they're gonna kill beneficial insects as well as non-beneficial. Um, and we really encourage you not to use them uh, widespread in your yard. If you have a particular spot or an infestation um, and you don't wanna remove the plant, um, then uh, you might wanna consider using it very sparingly. Uh, the larvae for beneficial insects will die if they consume plants treated with pesticides, and we'll talk about that, especially the monarch um, butterfly, um, caterpillars. Um, bees will die from collected pollen that are treated on um, plants, um, uh, um, the pollen that was tr on treated plants, excuse me. And um, then more importantly, and TRWD will support this, is your stormwater runoff carries these pesticides to the rivers. and we. Um, and causing them more damage to our ecosystem. And um, an example of this uh, is uh, our property is on a slant and uh, my husband would fertilize. And this was prior to me becoming a master gardener. And um, we probably were putting a weed and feed or something out that was um, not uh, something we would re I would recommend today. And then we would get a gully washer of rain and my neighbor's yard always looked prettier than our yard. And that is an indication <laughs> that our fertilizer and weed and feed always ended up in his yard. Um, and uh, because he never put anything like that out. So um, anyhow, so just a, even if you don't see it happening, it is happening and it is getting carried off into your stormwater 
Um, and then somebody has to treat that and remove it before that water can be used again. And a lot of times that water just ends up in the streams. And that's why the Trinity River is um, uh, in dire need of, um, uh, of cleaning. Um, the water in the Trinity River going through Fort Worth is, is um, not uh, ideal for you know, consumption or for swimming or anything like that. Um, so just keep all that in mind when you're um, thinking about how you might treat bugs or pests. Um, what to use instead? I recommend that you do some um, Google searches on this. Uh, we have used sticky traps, um, insecticidal soaps, uh, dormant oils. I used um, a horticulture oil on my fig tree this er early spring. Um, and did the job just fine. I have used that same horticulture oil on my crepe myrtle for um, uh, bark uh, scale mold, um, and that has worked. 20% uh, vinegar as a weed killer. Um, you have to be a little patient with that. Maybe have to apply it a couple of times. Definitely that how to apply it is on the bottle. Um, all of these things you can get at any of your big box stores or any um, uh, you know, um, landscape uh, nursery type environment. Um, and so, and then you can select some plants that will help deter other pet pests, um, like Citronella geraniums uh, will deter uh, mosquitoes, um, marigolds will um, also deter mosquitoes, but they also do other things in the garden as well to deter pests. So consider educating yourself on some of those types of plants and mixing them in with um, your other uh, plants in your garden. Okay, so let's talk about wildscape features for attracting butterflies. Um, we all love butterflies and the butterflies are gonna are out there and they will stop in your garden if you provide the right environment for them. What are the requirements for butterflies? You have to have a nectar plant, which is food. Um, you have to have host plants for their caterpillars. It is really wise to have both of these. Um, if you want to see all the generations of a butterfly in your garden, um, you definitely have to have the host plants for the caterpillars. You have to have a, wa you have to have a water source. You have to have shelter. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you have to have shelter and a place to rest in the sun. And I thought this was kind of interesting when I was doing my research on this, is that butterflies uh, like to fly when it's above 75 degrees. Um, and so early in the spring, when we're a little cooler in um, Texas, uh, the butterflies like to light on a plant or a place where they can get a little sun on them. It's kind of like a little sunbathing to warm them up so that they can go fly around um, to all the nectar plants. And uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. I didn't know that there was a temperature window for butterfly activity. We don't have to worry about that right now when it's gonna be 101 degrees today. So food for butterflies is nectar from flowers. And um, as I said, master gardeners tend to have every type of flower that I'm gonna list uh, in their garden. And so we are um, definitely encouraging uh, butterflies to come visit our gardens. Uh, hot, um, striking colors like red, pink, orange, purple um, are very attractive, not only to butterflies, but to hummingbirds. And um, if it has a tubular or trumpet shape, um, that is even uh, more striking and, and inviting. Um, standing cypress, um, Oh, I just, uh, uh, Sabia gregis um, are all very inviting plants. Um, then if the structure um, of the flower is flat or is presents their centers, makes it a little easier for the butterfly to, um, to light on and to get the nectar out of the center. Um, other food, you can do a nectar in a saucer or um, you can put some rotting fruit um, out. And right now I have uh, uh, 
figs that are overripe that drop off my fig tree. And um, I have seen a few butterflies light on that rotting fruit on the ground. Um, now, I'll show you in a minute um, some other ways to present the rotting fruit to the uh, butterflies. So specific plants that butterflies love. Um, there are a lot. We're um, only going to touch on a few here. If you um, uh, do some Google searches, look for plants for our region. Um, so South Central um, United States, um, because there are a lot of plants they'll recommend on the internet and they're not um, hardy or they will not survive our, our high temperatures in the summer here in Texas. So nectar plants for butterflies. You all may want to take a screenshot of this. Um, it's, uh, this is a list. I have almost every one of these plants in my garden um, and uh, they definitely do attract the butterflies. Um, aster, any variety. Um, there's goldenrod, garden phlox. If you don't have garden phlox in your summer garden, then you're missing out. It blooms profusely all summer. And I'm talking about the taller standard um, summer garden phlox. It is just beautiful and I see butterflies on it all the time. Um, there's Greg's Miss Flower, which might not even be on this, it is on this list. Um, just even a stone crop sedum, there is actually a sedum um, on this list. A lot of us have purple cone flower, uh, not, there's not a better plant to attract butterflies. Um, so you really can't go wrong. These are all very hardy in our area. They come back every year. And after about three or four years, you can share them with your friends. The Greg's Miss Flower, you probably can start sharing the next year with your friends. And then you're gonna have to find friends to share that with because it will take over your garden. So um, Abelia, I have some fair, um, four or five varieties of Abelia in my garden. And the Abelia is amazing. Uh, tractor of butterflies. And there are a lot of bees on it too, so be careful. But um, also garlic chives, can you believe that? Garlic chives, maybe possibly they have to bloom out in order to attract a butterfly, but that is a, an interesting one. You can use them uh, in your cooking and you can attract butterflies as well. So annuals. Um, in Texas, uh, lantana in our area can be a perennial. Um, a lot of people will list it as an annual. I put it under annuals to add to that list. So um, if we have a really, really hard freeze um, in the winter for multiple days, the lantana may not survive. So that's why it's usually listed as an annual. So we have lantana, we have zinnias, marigolds, cosmos. Uh, there's uh, a lot of annuals that will attract and offer nectar to butterflies. So, um, take some time to do a little research on these and, um, and consider those for your garden. Other types of food, we talked about um, uh, hummingbird nectar. Hummingbird nectar is actually good um, for butterflies as well. And they, you may see some on your, bird, on your hummingbird feeder. Uh, rotting fruit, now that just doesn't sound good, but you know, I think that's a kind of a neat idea for the kids. You can sort of take the orange slices or the old banana or something and um, take them out and every day go sort of eye the bowl or the container to see who's um, visiting your rotting fruit. Um, I think that's kind of a cool little um, exercise for kids. Um, the problem is that um, the butterflies really won't um, visit it if there are a lot of ants in it. So um, in, here in Texas, we have ants everywhere. So you may only be able to do it for a few days and um, then have to clean it out and start all over. Um, sweet stuff painted on tree trunks um, or in a saucer. Um, I, I don't know if they're talking about some of that um, carrot cake I made the other day or if they're talking about banana pudding. Um, uh, but <laughs> You can put sweet stuff painted on a tree trunk. And that may, you may want to Google that to see what sweet stuff really means there. Um, water, water, butterflies have to have a water source. Um, they drink water just like we do. Um, we cannot drown our butterflies. So it, they love mud puddles. 
and mud puddles can come from, um, you know, where your sprinklers may have hit the concrete a little bit um, and there's a little uh, puddle of water, they will light on that and um, drink from there. Um, they drink in the dissolved minerals and the nutrients. So, um, uh, so you, um, that's very beneficial to them. Uh, bird baths are kind of a deep water. So sometimes you put a rock or something in the bird bath that provides a landing site for the butterflies. And uh, you might want to try that if you have a bird bath that doesn't have a rock in it right now, you might want to put one in and see and watch it for a few days to see if the butterfly will light on it. And then you can put saucers out, but make sure that they're very shallow because we um, the butterflies only stand off the, the ground about a quarter of an inch to a half an inch and we don't want to drown them. Then shelter. Um, there are in our area, there's lots of shelter for butterflies between the trees, the shrubbery around our land and um, the basic shrubbery in our landscapes um, provides uh, lots of shelter for butterflies in the summer and in the spring and fall. But in the winter, um, they're going to want to hibernate. And yes, some of our uh, butterflies do not migrate. Um, and so they stay in the area and they'll get in the tree bark the wood piles, tall um, dead grasses, or spent perennials. And um, you probably will not see them there. Um, some of the people who are actively pursuing butterflies might know where to find them in the winter, but um, definitely um, that is where they're gonna be during the winter. Post plants for butterfly caterpillars. And this is really important. And as I was present, preparing this presentation, I had to educate my husband on all this information. And, and he thought, uh, found it very um, interesting that uh, butterflies will only lay their larva on a plant that their uh, larva can eat, consume. And so a monarch butterfly will only lay their larva on milkweed. Milkweeds become very popular and in demand in our area. There are a lot of different milkweeds available um, to put in your garden. Now, you have to remember that a lot of milkweeds were are, um, are found in the prairies or in the um, uh, fields. I live up near Circle T Ranch in um, uh, the Roanoke um, Westlake area, and um, I see. Uh, milkweed growing along the fence line um, there. And it, most milkweed really likes a, a non-fertile um, garden. And so a lot of people are struggling to grow milkweed, um, but there are varieties that are doing better than others. And I encourage you to reach out and um, educate yourself on which milkweeds are gonna work best in your garden. But definitely if you want, monarch butterflies to visit your garden and you want caterpillars, then you need to plant some milkweed in your garden. Um, black swallowtails, um, I had a good friend call me a year or two ago and we had planted brew around her pool. And she goes, I've been out here picking these caterpillars off all day. And I'm like, oh my goodness, she had 50 or 60 caterpillars on her brew and she was picking them off and throwing them out into the field. And I'm like, oh, please stop. They want that. You planted that to attract them. And so now she knows better. And she said that this year that uh, she actually has um, some caterpillars on her parsley. Um, and we will see these caterpillars. Uh, swallowtail are very common in this area. And we will see them on fennel, bronze fennel. Um, and I thought it was interesting that they would be on carrots um, as well. So then there's the tiger swallowtail and they have a lot of, um, it's interesting, they have trees yeah, that they like to um, lay their larva on. And then the pipe vine swallowtail will only lay their larva on Dutchman's pipe. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see um, what um, plants the larva will consume and um, make sure that you plant those in your garden if that is what you're looking for. And you can find a complete list of these things online uh, for the type of, um, uh, for the type of uh, um, butterfly that you are trying to attract to your garden and the caterpillars um, that you want to grow in your garden. 
So this is an example of a monarch uh, chrysalis and um, a caterpillar getting ready to form that chrysalis. And that is on milkweed. And um, isn't that just a beautiful butterfly? And we have so many programs throughout our area. I know Bob Jones does a big uh, monarch butterfly release and um, Grapevine does one and they tag the butterflies and they track them. And uh, one thing I learned, which was really interesting about um, monarch, butterf monarch butterflies is that they, um, only the fourth generation will migrate. Um, every fourth generation of monarch butterflies migrates. And so the other three generations stay in our areas. And um, that's why we need to have uh, lots of host plants with, um, and lots of nectar plants for those uh, butterflies and caterpillars. And this is milkweed. And these are our lovely um, caterpillars eating it. And now you have to just remember that you're planting these plants for them to come into your yard. So they are going to devour them. Now, one thing that is neat, and I watch this with a lot of my plants that I've planted for them, is that um, once that they've gone into a chrysalis state, um, the plant rejuvenates and comes back. Um, it may look like it's dead and gone, but it will rejuvenate and come back. So um, just enjoy watching the caterpillars. Um, sadly, we're gonna talk about birds in a minute. Um, this is one way to attract a lot of birds to your garden is to have um, host plants for caterpillars. Uh, I will go out and I'll count caterpillars on my bronze fennel, fennel. And then the next day I'll go out and count caterpillars and there'll be fewer. And then the next day there'll be fewer. <laughs> and they're not scurrying off. Um, and they're not building chrysalis. Uh, they are being consumed by birds. So you want to make sure you have plenty of plants so you have plenty of caterpillars and um, uh, and then you have plenty of food for birds and you can see some turn to chrysalis and then to butterflies. Um, again, this is a pipe uh, passion vine. So the uh, prettily uh, flitterary um, butterfly will only um, lay their eggs on a passion vine. And, um, I don't have a passion vine in my yard, but I have a friend that has huge passion vine and she's complaining about the damage being done to the foliage. And, um, and then I realized what it was going on. And so now she has to be content with the damage to the foliage so that she can get her pretty um, butterfly. So if you do wanna attract butterflies and monarchs specifically to your garden and you do plant all these plants, um, and you are successful with it, then you may want to become a Monarch Way Station. And to do that, you can just go to monarchwatch.org and you can get an application. And I have many master gardeners who are uh, way stations. There are school programs that we as master gardeners have supported um, in the South Lake area that are Monarch Way Stations. Uh, Bob Jones um, Nature Center, at, at at one time, we were talking about it becoming a Monarch uh, Way Station through our Master Gardeners program because we go up there and work uh, once a, uh, or twice a month um, to maintain their gardens. So I'm not sure where that has gone, but, um, but it is a, a great uh, program that you're supporting if you um, do decide to do that. So let's talk about birds. Um, we've seen a lot of birds because we've been home, and we've been paying attention. Uh, we all love birds um, and the requirements for birds are much like the butterfly, the food, the water, the shelter, um, the place to rest um, and a great place to raise their young. And again, um, there's gonna be some fallout from that because we do have an ecosystem. And um, uh, when you attract uh, birds, you attract other animals to your yard as well. So bird feeders, that's one of the simplest ways to attract birds. Um, and, and that is, gives you a lot of flexibility because different birds eat different types of uh, feed. They'll eat mealworms or a seed, uh, or they'll 
like the hummingbird presented here, we'll just use a nectar water. And um, so this way you can kind of almost dictate which kind of bird you're gonna pull into your yard or, or invite into your yard by the type of feed that you provide. Um, and so that's awesome. Now I've always had cats and so indoor outdoor cats. And so I've never encouraged birds to come to my yard uh, with bird feeders because I feel like that's just asking for them to sacrifice themselves to my cats. So what I have done is I have just planted a lot of trees and shrubs um, that offer berries in the winter for the birds. Um, and I just let nature do its course in inviting the birds. I offer a lot of hollies for them to nest in. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about the types of um, shrubs that are needed um, for birds in a minute. Ground feeders, there are ground feeders and um, I don't have any ground feeders in my yard, hardly at all. And I walked over to my neighbor's yard and went to his front yard and they had um, probably 50 robins on their um, turf in their front yard. And I have never seen one robin on the turf in my yard. And that's probably because I have cats. Um, and they do not have cats and they had just mowed the yard and I was just amazed. And they were all pulling um, insects and uh, worms from the ground where they had just mowed. And so um, isn't that just really interesting that they're a hundred um, yards away in somebody else's yard in mass and then I have never seen them in my yard. And um, I just find that just really interesting. So um, do know what birds are ground feeders and what birds um, are bird feeder feeders. Can you say that? Bird feeder feeders? So anyhow, so let's talk about trees and shrubs for shelter. Um, Possmall hollies, um, I have one. They're fabulous for your landscape. They are striking in the winter when their leaves drop off and the red berries are showing. Um, the birds love the Possmall hollies. Yopons are very prevalent in our area. They're a basic landscape plant that have been planted um, by builders for years. Um, they, uh, yopons can be kind of um, invasive. The birds will take the berries and they will drop them in other places and they will grow uh, very, very easily in somebody else's yard or in uh, uh, down the road. But they also provide berries for the um, birds. And sometimes um, I will get some migrating birds to my yopon and I will walk outside and they will have totally eaten every berry off of this huge yopon. Um, and they, there may have been 200 birds in the tree all at one time and they all flew off and there are very few berries left. But I was providing a source for them on their migration route. So that I thought was really cool. Um, so there are lots of uh, places for them to um, get shelter and food during the winter um, if you provide these kinds of um, shrubs. Water sources. We talked about water sources a little while ago. Same is true for birds as butterflies. Um, but I notice in my yard, because we have um, sprinklers, we have a pool and our pool has a water fountain. And I, I notice the birds and a lot of dove will come in and they will um, sip from the edge of the uh, water fountain. And, um, uh, and so we'll see a lot of birds doing that. And then um, they will also get up in the trees right above the sprinklers when they're running and they'll fly through the sprinklers. And um, I think that's fun to watch. Um, and you can see a lot of different types of birds at one time doing that. And right now when we're at 101 degrees, um, it's really important to make sure that um, if you are attracting birds to your garden, that you are um, providing some type of water for them, whether it's a dish of water um, or uh, a swimming pool or something like that. And then shelter. Obviously there's man-made shelters that are the um, bluebird houses, the, um, uh, uh, and, that bluebirds will come to and they will lay um, their, uh, they will put their um, uh, 
lay their eggs in there. And I've had several friends who've looked inside theirs and seen their little bluebird babies. Um, and then there's the Martins and a lot of people have Martin houses and a lot of people don't care for Martins, but, um, but they are eating bugs and insects and things around your yard that um, really helps keep your yard healthy. And then um, the shelter in the um, evergreen trees where they can put their um, uh, nest. And we have um, some savanna hollies and every year I see one or two nests in the savanna hollies and they're very protected there. Um, uh, any kind of holly, um, Nellie R. Stevens, any of those would work well for nesting birds. And then I have the 65 post oaks in my yard and uh, have a lot of post oaks that have holes in them uh, where limbs have rotted, um, fall, been cut off and then the knot rotted out. And I have seen lots of different birds um, nesting in those holes. And so it's really fun to walk around with binoculars and, and see what kind of activities um, is going on in the holes of the trees. And then not all birds um, eat seeds and berries. And we're aware of this, um, that uh, Cooper's hawk that's in my front yard is definitely not looking for um, beads and um, berries and seeds. Um, we believe that he's looking for baby rabbits, squirrels, and hopefully some mice um, that we've had a little problem with at our house. And so um, we welcome him as long as he leaves um, the bigger animals alone. Uh, we love to see the woodpeckers. I love to listen to them. Um, and they just keep the bugs at bay on some of the trees. And with me having so many post oak trees, we see a lot of woodpeckers. Um, we used to see roadrunners a lot in our area and uh, loved watching them. There would always be a pair of them that would show up every spring and uh, they are the funnest thing to watch. And if you see roadrunners, um, just be careful when they're crossing the street. And then we have the bigger um, birds of prey um, that are obviously gonna prey on um, sadly, they prey on other birds and baby birds. Uh, but again, it's our whole ecosystem. It's the way um, it's the way it was made to be. Uh, we are, talked about birds and butterflies, and those are wonderful. But if you've been home, you've noticed that there are a lot of other types of wildlife in your garden. I love dragonflies. Dragonflies. If you're sitting in your pool. Um, dragonflies are the funnest thing to watch because they are coming right over the pool and they're snatching up mosquitoes. And it's one of the funnest things to do if you're, if you're in the pool, stand very still and put your fingers up to your side. And those dragonflies will light on your fingers. Um, it may take them a few minutes and you have to be very patient, but it is so fun because then you get an up close um, picture of the butterfly and of the dragonfly and you get to examine it and it'll sit there for a long time. And it may probably just drink a little bit of the water off of your, your finger, um, but uh, that is a lot of fun and it's a trick we like to show the kids when they come uh, get in the pool. There are moths, lots of moths. Um, and um, the IO moth, this one's kind of interesting. I never pay much attention to the moth. Um, and then last year I had a red bud seedling in the front yard and I had 15 IO moth caterpillars on it. Now they actually will sting you. And my husband drove the uh, lawnmower past the red bud and um, almost I got stung. And I went out there and there were 15 of these caterpillars. And then the next day there were 12, the next day there were nine, and the next day there were seven. And so the birds obviously were finding them. They're big, green, juicy caterpillars. And um, I was probably okay with the birds getting the caterpillars because um, uh, they were a hazard to my husband and he was gonna make me cut the tree down if um, they stayed. So, um, you know, some life is all about negotiating. So uh, the birds took care of that problem for me. And then beneficial insects, oh, this is fun. I have um, a lot of Rosa Sharon or Atheas, and I see a lot of praying mantis on um, those. I think that's really neat. 
I had probably seven different types of insects on my Rosa share that was right next to my patio last year, and it was so fun to watch them. Um, lacewing um, insects, um, it is always exciting to see a garden spider and their um, webs somewhere in your garden. And um, I know some people are very frightful of um, spiders, but if you take a minute and really watch that spider, it, he's just fascinating, he or she. Is just fascinating. So these are bugs or insects that we like in our garden and we will have them if you plant all the other plants we were talking about. Oh and these are fun. I have so many geckos and anoles and spiny lizards. Um, I had a really fun story about a spiny lizard. Oh probably seven or eight years ago a friend of uh, my daughter's was over and we were she was walking through the living room and she said, wow, you have a, a stuffed lizard. And I look over and on my ottoman, there was a, probably a 12 inch long spiny lizard sitting there staring at us like, I don't really wanna be in here. Come to find out my cat had brought it in and it was sitting there going, how do I get outside? And it was really funny cause I was a little frightful of a 12 inch long spiny lizard and, um, but the young lady that was visiting us asked pet snakes. And so she was definitely not frightful of it. So I allowed her to pick it up and take it back outside. But that was kind of funny. And we've had several of those brought into our house at times. But um, another neat thing that my husband and I have done about um, toads and frogs when we have a swimming pool is that we purchased, um, uh, skimmer lids that have ramps in them. And so uh, we were having a lot of problem with toads and um, frogs getting in our pool and dying and not having an escape exit so um, or escape route. So we bought these skimmer lids and they're a little pricey, but um, they sure have been beneficial. We don't have any problem now with, um, with the frogs and the toads drowning in the pool, but check those out, um, Google Spinner, um, skimmer lids with for frogs and toads. Um, anyhow, so just another way to protect our animals that visit our garden. And then small animals. I have so many stories I could share with you about small animals. And if you live up in the Cross Timbers area, I can promise you have them too. Uh, the other night I was going to bed and I have up lighting on my fig tree outside my bedroom window. And I look out and I have a pair of possums out there munching on my figs. Um, and they came back several nights and they still come back. Um, but one, uh, I don't know what happened to the mate, but when animals visit my garden like that, I tend to name them. So that was Owen and Opal. And they were um, just sitting up precariously on the branches, reaching for the figs. And I will tell you, that possums don't chew with their mouth closed. It was pretty fun to watch. Um, we have had lots of nests of rabbits um, in the corner of our property uh, and love the rabbits, love watching them. In fact, last night I was in the front yard and um, I got within five feet of a rabbit and who was munching on our grass. And um, uh, then I didn't want to scare it off too much because it was going to head toward the uh, road. So uh, anyhow, I walked, uh, backtracked away from it, but love seeing them. However, with all of these creatures, they bring in the bigger creatures. And um, sometimes those are not friendly to your garden. Um, the bobcats, we have those in our area. I um, have not seen one in my particular yard for uh, probably about seven or eight years, but my neighbor, um, above me has said that she has seen a family of them several times. Deer, we do not have deer where I live. However, I know that a lot of people who live up near Grapevine Lake um, have deer and deer can be a nuisance. Um, and um, you can, uh, some people love to see them and some people uh, do not care to have them in their yard. And, uh, and if you love to see them, Typically your neighbor is the one that doesn't love to see them. 
and that's always the way it goes. And so they scare them off and you don't get to see them. So um, anyhow, the, there are ways to attract deer to your yard and you can look um, those up if you would like to see some deer. The coyotes are gonna come. My neighbors put in backyard uh, chickens um, and every day my uh, another neighbor put up a hunting camera and has caught uh, coyote images almost every night. Uh, whether the chickens are um, cooped at night or not, they still smell and they pull, um, they are encouraged the coyotes to come walk through the yard and check them out. Maybe hoping that maybe the chicken coop was left open um, uh, that night. So um, the coyotes are out there in our area. You have to really be careful of your um, animals. And then a really fun thing that happened this summer was that we had a wild um, turkey who made a half mile migration every day from where she must have been living um, uh, two blocks away. And she would come over to my neighbor's backyard where he feeds squirrels. And you're like, why would somebody feed squirrels? Well, he feeds squirrels to entertain his dog. And I thought that was kind of interesting. <laughs> Gives his dog exercise. He has a big tree in the backyard. He puts the um, squirrel feed up in there and the squirrels come through the trees and down to get the feed. The dog cannot get the squirrels, um, but the dog darts out of the house, runs circles in the tree and gets all his exercise he needs um, several times a day and the squirrels are happy. Well, the turkey decided he needed some of that feed and he could jump the fence. So he jumped the fence and he uh, would be uh, seen back there eating some of what would fall on the ground. And I thought that was really fun. So if you're ambitious and you really do want to work in your garden to develop a wildlife habitat, there are several ways to do it. There's a National Wildlife Federation where you can um, uh, submit your garden. You can get an uh, application and fill the form out online and then you pay a fee, um, but you have to meet criteria. And so if you want to develop a wildlife habitat, I would go ahead and and look at the criteria they look at and um, plan your garden around that criteria. And then we have a state um, certification, habitat certification, and you can go to this website. Um, and it's a little longer form and as everything in Texas, it's a little bit more um, uh, uh, difficult to get the certification. Uh, there is, um, two different types. There's a wildscape and then there is a backyard habitat. And um, so I would encourage you if you're really going home on um, providing um, a wonderful backyard for or front yard for all of our critters and you want to maintain it, um, that I encourage you to look into these um, certifications. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. And I really appreciate your time. And if you have any questions, there'll be um, some information following on how to relay those to me and I will get um, back with those. Now I am not a bird or butterfly specialist. Um, I, my specialist mainly is on plants. So I would um, encourage you to Google um, information about birds and butterflies. Um, but if you have plant spe uh, specific questions um, and placement of plants and things like that in your garden, then uh, please feel free to reach out to me. And thank you very much. Thank you again for joining us this morning for the Gardening for Wildlife presentation brought to you by Bob Jones Nature Center in the city of South Lake and Tarrant Regional Water District. If you'd like to see um, some other events just like this that are coming in the future, you can go to safeterrantwater.com slash event. Again, if you have any questions about this, um, this presentation, you can go ahead and type them into the chat box and then we'll get back to you with an answer. And um, I'll submit them to the speaker and make sure that the speaker gives you an answer. Also, you're free to email us at conservation at trwd.com with any questions and we'll get back to you with an answer. 
If you'd like to stay connected with us and receive our once monthly newsletter, you can go to safeterrantwater.com slash sign dash up. And our newsletter um, has all of our events that are coming up in it, information about gardening in North Texas, native plants, water conservation, and things like that. So thank you again for joining us for this presentation.